Good evening and welcome back to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram. Discussing the cases tonight, we have an expert panel consisting of Dr Lynn King, GP Supervisor in Toowoomba, Dr Andrew St John, Staff Specialist, Gastroenterologist at Toowoomba Base Hospital. We have Miss Yvonne Chen, Dietitian here at Toowoomba Hospital, and Mr Fred Yeo, also a pharmacist at Toowoomba. Welcome, please welcome our specialists and expert panellists. As usual, we are being live streamed around Australia. We have a number of participants watching remotely, so I encourage you all to join the discussions by emailing your questions to grandrounds at qrme.org.au or you can tweet your questions using the hashtag now on your screen. Returning for the follow-up presentation tonight um, is our presenter, Dr Kent Perkins from Toowoomba. Please put your hands together for Kent. Thanks, Lucy. My name's Kent. Um, this is actually a presentation of a colleague's case. So it's a 53-year-old man who's been known to the practice for 12 months, and he's presented with nine days of diarrhoea. Sounds like a, a reasonably standard presentation. However, he's been to the emergency department recently, um, about three days ago, where he had six days of diarrhoea. He had some fluid resuscitation there um, and was discharged. Uh, the symptoms that he complained of at the time were diarrhoea that was watery with uh, no blood or mucus in the stool. He had some crampy abdominal pains and he you know, didn't have any signs of an acute abdomen. And so they just assumed that it was a viral gastroenteritis, gave him a bit of fluids, and asked him to come back to the GP for follow-up of the stool sample tests. His past medical history includes depression and PTSD. He's got uh, liver cirrhosis from hepatitis C, which he's had for 10 years as a result of his previous IV drug use. Um, and he's currently in the middle of an interferon program, well, towards the end of the interferon program. He also has type 2 diabetes, uh, reflux, and he's had a previous fracture of his left uh, tib fib. He lives alone and he's a smoker. Um, currently doesn't drink alcohol, um, but in the past he's had a history of uh, binge alcoholism. Um, and as I mentioned before, he had a history of IVDU, used amphetamines, but apparently he has been clean for 10 years. Currently he's on Duloxetine, and he's on um, dual treatment for the hepatitis C, that's in SIVO and Pegasus. Um, and then he's on Nexium for his reflux symptoms. So both Pegasus and in SIVO are pretty awful medications in terms of side effects. Um, and if we look at what he's experiencing, these are pretty typical of what people go through. Um, so he's had quite a number of side effects from the medications, including blurred vision, poor balance, feeling faint, nausea, loss of appetite, fatigue, headaches. Interestingly, he had thunderclap headaches, and um, the Pegasus is associated with um, intracranial hemorrhage, so that's important. Um, he's also got insomnia, some arthralgia and shaking, uh, photosensitive rashes, they're a big side effect of these medications, the various types of rashes, um, and most recently diarrhoea. Um, so these are monitoring his bloods over time. We can see there was a brief period of some anemia in there, which about 34% of patients get on in SIVO. Um, and then there's some uh, lymphocyte changes also, which are consistent with the drug side effects and platelet cha uh, changes as well. Um, and then we've got the chronic liver function derangement. Um, so he's not had any hepatitis C detected in his bloodstream since uh, November last year. Currently his renal function's good um, and his last HbA1c was pretty good as well. So he came to the practice three days after being in the emergency department, as I said, for follow-up of his results. They're all negative. Um, but his diarrhoea had persisted, um, 
which is obviously getting far too long for viral gastroenteritis. Um, and he's now spent $100 on Hydrolyte in terms of trying to keep himself hydrated. Um, and we ordered a fecal multiplex PCR, which was also, uh, which showed, sorry, Camp Campylobacter jejuni. So he was then prescribed azithromycin and uh, the diarrhea resolved. Uh, but after discussing with the infectious diseases specialist, it was decided to stop the um, interferon therapy. Um, so in terms of questions for the panelists, it's, we need to think about how can GPs take good care of patients who are in treatment for hepatitis C? They're obviously at risk of a lot of uh, complications and we need to be aware of them. Is there any association between Campylobacter infection and his underlying conditions um, or the treatment? And would there be a better approach for this case in terms of investigating the cause of his diarrhea? And when do we need to refer chronic hepatitis C patients for treatment? And when do we stop the treatment if they're experiencing side effects? Thanks very much, Lynn. Great question. Um, why don't we start once again with Lynn? <laughs> GPs are primary care, come physician, you know, there for the, um, yeah. That's right, first up. First up. <laughs> um, um, so what do you think of that first question? Um, how can we take good care of patients on treatment for hepatitis C? Well, um, hepatitis C treatment is, is, a, um, is a program, six to 12 months, and, so, and there are lots of issues. And in my experience, I've managed half a dozen patients that have done the program. They are managed, the, the, the um, program is initiated and drug dosage, etc., is all sorted out by the Hepatitis C Centre, which in Toowoomba was um, Toby House at the sta at that time. Are they still doing that? Is mm -hmm. that local? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't had a patient on the program now for a few years. <laughs> um, but it's, we ran, and I presume they still do, and they should, a good share care model. They mm -hmm. notified me the patient was going on the treatment. <clears throat> they sent me a good package of information because they're drugs that I'm not familiar with. They're not day-to-day -day drugs for general practice. They sent me this whole package of things, which in all honesty didn't read three quarters of it, but I read some part of it. And, uh, and just... So, and as a GP, so a patient walks in and says, oh, I'm now on the Pegasus treatment. And you go, oh, yes, I remember all that. No, you don't do that. You say, oh, I'm quite honest and upfront and say, I haven't had a patient on this for a little while. I'll read up about it again to remember mm -hmm. the things that I've got to be looking mm -hmm. for, you know, that they're at risk of infection and that they're um, at risk of anemia and blood abnormalities. But... Uh, with the program, they've usually been told to go and have bloods. So I just ask the patient, what have you been told to do? And they're, oh, I've got to have bloods, you know, here and here and here. I've got to do these injections here and here and here. And, and, uh, and that's what coincided with the information I'd been sent. So like with any chronic disease or any management that's come from a specialist, it's good to confirm that they're doing what they've been told, which is why good specialists always keep you in the loop just to reinforce or make sure they haven't got it mucked up and etc. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, and I think, and I'll be interested to see what Andrew says, the biggest issue with hepatitis C treatment are the psychiatric um, complications. And in my, it seems as though everybody gets depressed and fatigued and, dis and mentally it's a very trying course. Mm -hmm. So as a GP, that is kind of up our alley, supporting people that are stressed, distressed, fatigued. Are they depressed or are they making the diagnosis of depression? Mm. And, uh, and so looking for that is, one of the main, is something that if we notice it before the clinic notices it, well, then we should start the antidepressants. Um, um, so... Yeah, so it's something, so a good GP would be, so it, like with any patient that arrives with something that you, you're not familiar with, you mm. open up the product information and read through the side effects and listen to the patient. Mm. And if mm. they're saying to you, I'm fatigued or I'm, I'm down and da-da-da-da, 
and I often swing the screen around and say, look, there it is. We've got to deal with it. It's mm. written there, you know, because that's... Uh, I can't remember every side effect of every drug, neither can, no. can our friendly pharmacist, I'm sure you can't. <laughs> so, yeah, you look can't. it up as well, we don't you? We still refer to product information. Yeah. Well, as you say, let them read and mm. reassure, get more information and refer back them back to the GP or specialist. Yeah. Mm. I was going to ask you, Brida, yeah. um, how, how nasty are these medications? They are pretty nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that is when, um, when they come into the pharmacy for their regular fill-up of their medications, you ask them about specifically what you have been experiencing and always get to the phone or write a thing to the doctors, you know, these patients, we know this, da-da-da. Mm. Would you like to see them? Could you see them a bit earlier and discuss about these issues? Mm. That's what we do. Mm. But Pegasus, I haven't had much to do with Pegasus, but back in the days where I worked in hospital, people do come in with a lot of uh, psychological problems mm. and that's the mainstay of treatment beside um, their immune system, their blood abnormalities and etc. Mm. 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 Absolutely. So it looked like some pretty um, serious sort of side effects that this chap was having. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What are your take, take on uh, this case? Well... Side effects are extremely common, particularly with um, triple therapy with telaprevir or bisoprevir. Mm. And I'm pleased to say that the days of those drugs still being used are, are numbered now. Um, and of course, anything that involves interferon is, is a very dirty treatment in terms of the side effects. Uh, almost anything that happens to a patient on treatment could be related to the medical therapy, you'd have to say. The more severe side effects that we would see, particularly at Tilapavir, would be the rashes. Um, and in cirrhotic patients, particularly those on, on the edge of decompensation, they would get potentially bad infective complications. And that's probably the most common reason that they were stopped, was because they were developing pneumonia and, and serious infections. And most of the fatalities in the literature are related to infective complications from... Uh, and this is in cirrhotic patients, not just mm. bog standard mm -hmm. hepatitis C, cirrhotic patients who are being treated with triple therapy because it is very toxic. Mm. And the most common reasons we don't treat patients, uh, the severity of their liver disease is too great or that they have um, psychiatric conditions which would make treating the patient dangerous to themselves or others, so previous suicidal behaviour or ideation or previous history of violent crime, um, so people who've previously been in prison, if you treat them with uh, interferon, they reoffend. they end up back in prison. We're not really doing them any favours, are we? Mm. So that, they're the most common reasons we don't treat people. But I guess from, from the perspective of the GP side of things, it may be possible that patients haven't disclosed all the information about their past history mm. to us. So mm. if you see someone come back to you on treatment and you're quite worried that they may be at risk of suicide or of, of, of violence, then um, that would potentially be a reason to stop, mm -hmm. stop treatment early, uh, not because they're getting side effects or anything mm -hmm. like that, but that there's a, a serious risk mm -hmm. to the patient or the community um, because they haven't uh, disclosed that information to the, to the specialist unit. So, mm. Mm. How often should the GP be seeing these patients? Well, I guess it depends on this, the setup of your, or your clinic. Uh, mm -hmm. It is possible to manage these patients entirely through the clinic if you have good nursing staff who are contactable 24 hours a day, well, almost 24 hours a day, but that they're attached to a hospital where they can access an emergency department. Um, uh, a shared care system uh, works well often, particularly for the tr patients that are treated through Toowoomba because they're, they're not all in Toowoomba, they're all around Toowoomba. Mm -hmm. Plus there's a lot of patients in uh, the prison system who are being treated. Um, so I think shared care works well. Uh, how often? I mean, it's, it's tailored to the patient, really. Uh, mm. uh, we have to think about the patient population. The injected drug users uh, are particularly difficult, or the previous injected drug users are particularly difficult because they often have a lot of side effects. Uh, they have a lot of pain issues. They're much more likely to suffer from severe lethargy, fatigue. Uh, they're certainly unlikely to be able to work on treatment, so you have to warn them ahead of time. Uh, so that will be a lot more work to get them through. You may need, be needing to see these patients, you know, once a week or once a fortnight potentially to get them through because they do need a lot of reassurance mm. Mm. Um, because the last thing you want someone to do is to start an expensive treatment that may or may not work and then for them to stop after two weeks uh, and mm. then that's, that's uh, futility at work. But um, I, think, I think it is hard. Some patients need 
to be nudged along the whole way. Other mm. patients tolerated very well. We also obviously have patients who acquired it from blood transfusions in the 80s or from overseas through vaccinations or dental procedures. And they mm. tend to tolerate the treatment a lot better. But as I said, the days are numbered for these treat treatments. We're going to have interferon-free all oral therapy in the next few years. And uh, yeah. your patients uh, will be completely well most of the time. <laughs> wow. And, uh, I've, I've, I was involved in some clinical trials of these uh, medications and it was like they were on no treatment at all. So it's a completely different world. Mm. So not to take any gloss off this case, no. but, <laughs> but uh, I, they only brought out the triple therapy at the end of my core training. So I didn't have a lot of experience with this uh, treatment other than the patients that ended up in a hospital um, who were very sick. So that's obviously the severe end of the spectrum. But um, I'm very glad that just as I'm coming into consult life that uh, these medications are starting to be phased out. Mm. But these new medications that you're talking about, are mm. they going to be um, generally available and are, are they relatively expensive or inexpensive or well, government funded? current therapies are already quite expensive mm. um, and that's one of the reasons why, surprisingly, the PBAC has approved some of these new medications with no uh, limitations on previous uh, failure mm. to respond or relapses. Uh, so it looks like in the coming years, um, interferon-based therapy will be more or less phased out for the majority of patients with hepatitis C. It's, it's genotype dependent, mind you. So mm. genotype one is going to be the one that changes first and maybe three next. So we're going to see a, a dramatic change in who gets treated. And of course, a lot of patients are waiting to be treated and they can't have interferon for various reasons mm -hmm. or they know what's happen, happening overseas because these treatments are being used overseas. Uh, occasionally patients acquire medical medication from overseas and they'll come to their specialist and say, I've got a bottle of the new medication, can I start taking it now? Uh, yeah. And of course, if the patient's prepared to pay for the medication uh, without government funding, because it's presently not funded, um, then by all means oh. they can. Um, but we're still waiting for things to happen. I think the PBAC approval for that only came through a month or two ago. So uh, that's going to be a, a, a little while yet before we know what, what's going to be available. Not to mention, every time there's a new medication, there's a new protocol, there's a new, you know, when do you check their PCR, how long are they going to be on treatment for. Mm. But the newer treatments will probably be, we'll be looking at six weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks at the most. Mm. So less treatment, less side effects. Mm -hmm. So in fact, even though the treatment's more expensive, it's probably cost effective because patients won't be oh. unwell. Um, the success rates are higher, mm. over 90%. So it's going to be a whole new world of treatment. If they mm. let GPs prescribe it, then <laughs> GPs would be able to cure hepatitis C. I mean, it, the, the, the treatment is totally different. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very it's encouraging. Good. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, of the patients that I've had uh, over the years, only one mm. remained in the workforce while they're on treatment. Everybody mm. else had to go on to sickness benefits. Mm. They just mm. could not manage. Mm. So six or 12 months of that... And then, interestingly, today, I saw the lady that actually remained in the workforce just today, kind of serendipitously, and I said to her, which she didn't know, I said, you were the only patient that I've had on these treatments. That being said, she only had interferon. It was way back. She didn't have to have the dual other... Dual or triple. I should dual just triple, interferon. Yeah. I did, yes. Monotherapy. Monotherapy. This was oh. quite a while ago, oh. whatever. But she said, no, she said, I worked, but I shouldn't have. Looking back, I was so fatigued... Mm. I went home, I never went out anywhere socially for 12 months. Mm. Mm. I just went home and went to bed at seven, you know, straight after tea. And, um, and so her life, she said, so it was a, a different year of my life, she said, but I am cured and she's cured and that's, that's mm. good. So um, it'll be, yeah. So the other thing is GPs have to do for this illness, there's like, so therefore there's Centrelink documentation and mm. all the certification. So, the support of the GP, you will be involved, you know, and you should be because it's a, um, yeah, patients, it's good for them to know that their GP is there to support them, to do their documentation, mm -hmm. that to talk to um, sometimes in specialist clinics, they don't get a lot of time with the specialist and they mm -hmm. have three or four or five or six or seven or eight more questions about the drugs, etc. and that's where mm -hmm. we um, should come in a little bit to encourage them. And the pharmacist yeah. comes in and, you know, to answer some of those questions. But, um, 
yeah. that they're entitled to know the answer to. Mm. Yeah, the other thing with these the medications that are being phased out is that um, compliance is also an issue. I think is it Bisepravir? It's you have to be taking the tablets like six or eight hours apart or thereabouts. And for a lot of patients, that's hard, particularly if you're still working. Uh, and the newer therapies will be once or twice daily, uh, all combined in potentially in one tablet. So mm. it's just gonna, no injections. Uh, it's just going to be a completely different ballgame. Mm. It's amazing. <laughs> I was going to say, um, if we can come back to with this case, um, this patient mm. developed a Campylobacter infection. Um, so how serious is a Campylobacter infection? If it's not detected, uh, it can be serious. Like what happened for this gentleman, mm. he was quite sick. And um, is, it a, is, it, is there an association uh, with his condition and Campylobacter? Well, I, I think when you're, in, you're effectively immunosuppressed because of your liver cirrhosis, and then on top of that, because you're on, on this, this therapy, uh, it, it's more likely that you're going to get a range of infections, and this would be one of them. Um, you still have to acquire the infection from somewhere, maybe he ate something uh, dodgy somewhere, he ate takeaway food, I don't know, but um, they, they, you get these infections and I guess you have to, it raised a, a thought in my mind about what happens with patients who go to the emergency department rather than seeing their GPs and, and often that is a counterproductive exercise because certainly the public system, they don't have the multiplex PCR and uh, when they order tests in the emergency departments, they often, you know, are not expecting to need to follow them up and the stool culture takes up to five days to get a result. So that, that test is not generally useful for emergency departments to do. And uh, for some reason, they rarely ever admit patients that actually need admission in my specialty. <laughs> That's what I find anyway. So patients often uh, go back to their GP and then get some proper management. But in this case, all he needed was prompt investigation and treatment and that would have, you know, shorten the duration of his illness and he would have been much less unwell for, for a lot less time. Mm. So that was the problem there. And, mm. and, and that higher level of suspicion because he was on his treatment, mm. sort of investigate him quickly. Mm. Yes, Chris. yes, because I mean, we, we, don't, we don't treat liver patients like chemotherapy patients in, in terms of opportunistic infections, but hepatologists do. And in the literature, for treating patients with variceal bleeding or who are very sick, the most important intervention is early initiation of appropriate broad-spectrum antibiotics. And that's probably the only thing that improves survival. Certainly for GI bleeding, we think of octreotide and PPI infusions, but the only thing that's really useful is keftriaxone dose. So it's all about the antibiotics. And that's because they get bacterial translocation in the gut. They are immunosuppressed. You'll notice that a lot of them have, uh, they're relatively pancytopenic. Often they get a neutrophil response within the normal range. So their normal neutrophil count might be two and it goes up to six when they're unwell. But of course, none of that registers because it's still in the normal range. So you have to have a very low index of suspicion uh, for patients who are unwell with liver disease, not to mention the fact that it mm -hmm. takes a lot for them to have a fever because they're usually hypothermic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are important considerations, more for hospital staff because that's where they get the sickest patients coming in and that's where mm. often an admission can lead to, to great harm. But it's an important thing to think about in the, mm. in the community because mm. I've seen a lot of patients come to harm due to lack of investigation and lack of appropriate antibiotics. And um, I always consider them to be like an immunosuppressed patient. Mm. And they certainly get, they get uh, fungal lung infections. They get mm. infections mm -hmm. that only really immunosuppressed patients will get. So we do see that. Uh, and it is a problem mm. when they get that. Mm. Mm. Because the average GP is not going to have very many people with severe cirrhosis mm. and mm -hmm. severe and liver failure, you know. Mm. And, yes. you know, I would only have a couple of my books at the minute, you know. So you're not thinking about it on a regular mm. basis, but, yeah. Mm. Uh, Fred, if I can come to you, this chap had uh, six days of diarrhoea mm. and then a further three days of diarrhoea and he'd spent hundreds on hydrolyte yep. and gastrolytes. <laughs> can you talk us through the products in the pharmacy for mm -hmm. diarrhoea and... Um, can they get very expensive for the patients? Uh, well, they, they can, uh, but then you have the uh, benefit of going through discount pharmacy to get really good, reasonable price uh, <laughs> compared to if you go to after hours where the business owner needs to cover the cost and things. So uh, they do have options, um, mm. but the benefit of buying the gastrolyte and spend the money is way 
more beneficial compared to if they don't have it and getting uh, dehydrated and cause more mm. problem mm. down the tracks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and there are many flavors nowadays for gastrolite and hydrolytes mm -hmm. as well. So they do have a lot of choices. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, not mentioning your gastro stop and then Lomatil, those are quite easily accessible. But from the pharmacy point of view, every time when people come in with a diarrhea, um, we don't normally just sell them. They go take the gastrolite, uh, you no know, gastro stop, and you'll be fine. We do investigate very thoroughly before that box get hand to them. That's why it is a schedule two or schedule three. Yeah. yeah. The emergency okay. departments are good at giving patients gastro stop as well inappropriately. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and can I ask you, Yvonne, just about um, when patients have diarrhoea and it's a little bit prolonged, you know, when should they start eating solids? Because a lot of patients, I think, you know, avoid uh, food while they're having diarrhoea. Well, why, when a patient is having diarrhoea and they're a bit worried about having solids, I think the most important thing is to keep them hydrated mm. and also to keep getting something nutritious in not just water so they can have some smoothies, mm -hmm. like... Um, have some protein in the smoothies such as dairy, ice cream, a yogurt, or a bit of fruit. So to keep the nutrition going and at the same time they got the hydration. Mm, that's interesting. I think a lot of patients avoid dairy when mm. they've got diarrhea as well. Well, it depends on the cause of the diarrhea. Mm. If the patient is lactose intolerant, then you probably don't want to touch the dairy, but uh, if that is not so much of an issue then. Mm, but an yeah. acute sort of gastroenteritis or something similar. Yeah. Dairy should be fine. Mm. And if I can be a little bit controversial, probiotics in a case like this, <laughs> helpful? That, if we know that this person is on Pegasus, definitely probiotics wouldn't be any more beneficial compared to if they you know, rather get their money spent somewhere else more beneficial. Mm. Yeah, probiotics wouldn't be recommended in this case. But if it's just a normal long-term, as I mentioned before, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, probiotics may be recommended depending mm. on their preference mm. and they do see improvement in certain type of patients. Mm. What yeah. about following the course of the antibiotics to clear away the Campylobacter? Um, I think in this sort of situation where you've used a very specific antibiotic over a very short course, mm. I wouldn't be particularly concerned about that. I mean, if you start to worry about what's going to happen when you prescribe antibiotics, how many, how many of my patients are going to get C. diff, um, you'll stop prescribing antibiotics altogether. And some people might say that's a good thing. Mm. Um, but, you know, so if this guy got uh, C. diff after that, that would be quite bad. And I don't think giving probiotics would make a huge difference in that regard. Mm. Zithromycin is not particularly associated with C. diff. Mm. Um, so I would be comfortable just treating this guy's campylobacter and leaving it at that. Mm. Um, but yes, uh, yeah, it makes you nervous when you see patients with refractory C. diff occasionally that, um, that you, you might cause it one day. Um, but uh, yeah, the good, the good thing with this guy was that he was near the end of his treatment and mm. he could stop it. Mm. Um, I don't necessarily think, in this case, was, there, was it mandatory that he yeah. stopped treatment when he did? I'm not so sure. I mean, mm. it's very subjective and it, it's, it's uh, consultant dependent if you talk to mm. hepatologists about when they would stop treatment. The reason I think it was stopped here was because he was very close to the end of treatment. Um, but if it was earlier on and you were pushing hard for a response, then you probably would push on because he's had an mm. illness which has now been treated um, and he's well after treatment. I don't think you'd necessarily need to stop treatment. Mm. Mm. I was surprised at that. He only mm. had one course to go. Yeah. You know, mm. let's finish it. But... Um, is there a certain amount of time that you want to see that the hepatitis C ha is not detectable? Because it was not detectable for some, uh, some period months. of months. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure when, when that was. So it was, mm. it was negative from November or December? Yeah. Yes. And where, where that was, was that about halfway through the treatment? Or I'm, not, I'm not sure. But mm. the, the speed at which you achieve your uh, negative PCR, your virologic response, is, is important for predicting the response. Ultimately you check your PCR six months after treatment and that tells you whether you have a sustained virologic response and that's the really important endpoint mm. uh, for this guy. And um, in the old days, uh, for him, if he didn't achieve, achieve that, he'd be concerned. He's cirrhotic, he's failed treatment. What are you going to do next? But with new drugs on the horizon, he would have a chance. Second chance. Something <laughs> further. Yeah, so it would be okay for him. But, uh, mm. 
Mm. Um, so, oh, sorry, can Lee. I make a que ask another yeah. question then? Because mm. I didn't realise these new drugs were mm. on the horizon. Well, they're closer than the horizon by the sound yes, of it. Yes. So people that have been deemed to be not suitable in the past, mm. um, which I have several patients, mm. it's worth when they're on PBS to yes. re-refer them to the hepatitis C clinics yep. at our local... Yes. Our local hepatitis clinic. It's, yes. Yeah. And yeah. that sort of brought up the question of sort of when should we refer? Mm. So I understand it's best when the disease is active or there's certain um, stages when it should be referred or is any time uh, a good time? It depends who you ask. And if you ask the government, they, would, they don't <laughs> want you to treat everyone all at once. And the, <laughs> new, the new treatments will allow you to treat everyone all at once if you want. Um, we have to prioritise treatment for the patients who need it most. So patients who are cirrhotic or... Um, on the verge of becoming cirrhotic need to be treated first. The real cost benefit in treating patients is reducing the burden of disease in terms of liver cirrhosis and liver cancer and liver transplantation. So stopping pa patients getting cirrhosis or progressing with their cirrhosis is the priority. Um, but they're not going to restrict uh, treatment to those patients, it looks like. Um, of course, if you treat people who have acquired it in the last 10 years, who are younger, you're going to stop them from having liver-related morbidity and mortality 30 years down the track, potentially. So it's going to take a long time to see that benefit come through. Um, but ultimately, what happened in the past uh, when we started treating hepatitis C originally with interferon was we reserved it for patients who had active disease, who had fibrosis on their mm. liver biopsy. And I think in the end, we did more harm than good because we restricted treatment to patients who were less likely to respond. We know mm. that if you're cirrhotic, interferon is less effective. So we were treating a harder to treat population. We neglected treatment for patients who were easy to treat. And then as the time went by, they became cirrhotic as well. And we were really not doing any, anyone any favors. So I think that the fact that the PBAC has looked at this and uh, looked at the big picture and the cost of current treatment versus new treatment, I think they've made a very wise decision about not restricting treatment. And I think that the future is actually looks very good for patients with hepatitis C, albeit in a few years' time, potentially. Um, mm. But I think ultimately um, we're going to get to a point where we're screening everyone for hepatitis C who's at risk and we're treating everyone who has it, preferably after they stop using injected drugs. And, um, and we're going to do uh, everyone a lot of favours and ultimately possibly not be uh, transplanting patients for hepatitis C anymore. Mm. But that would be nice. Mm. But that's a long way in the future. Mm. Mm. The future. Very interesting. Can I, may I just suggest a um, product that is used in our patient ground who use long-term antibiotics but still consider a specific probiotics for their um, in, intestinal health? There's this product from Bioceutical, which is a practitioner, practitioner line you can get from pharmacy. They call it Flow Active. Mm. or something like that. Mm. Yeah, apparently with the long-term antibiotics, uh, the strain that they use are not being uh, affected by the antibiotics. Mm. So they do have their play in terms of maintaining a healthier intestinal mm. interflora so that you get less side effects instead of diarrhea, cramping, and etc. Mm. I'm mm. not sure if... So it's essentially an antibiotic resistant bacteria yeah, that some, we're introducing like, for patients. That's right, yeah. It's fascinating <laughs> that we've come around to this yeah. way of thinking. We are trying on uh, this in our pharmacy at the moment. And those people who are on long-term antibiotics mm. seem to have less problem. I'm not sure because they are not being affected or mm. is it just coincidence? Mm. But people do come back and say, oh, can I have that probiotics? Mm. So what kind of um, cases yeah. are you talking about, like, um, say, hip wrecks for UTIs or uh, talking about amoxyl, like a month Yeah, like year, Keflex, or? amoxicillin, those broad, broad spectrum antibiotics that they mm -hmm. use for four, three months mm. and et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or people who continue to get you know, infections and they mm. do need ongoing intermittently antibiotics, those are the patients who come in and say, um, give me that antibiotic so that I don't get thrush and et cetera. Mm. Mm. We find that the patients with decompensated cirrhosis often will be on regular antibiotics for prophylaxis of spontaneous bacterial mm. peritonitis and they mm. may be on Bactrim or Norfloxacin on a regular basis. And um, it's important to be conscious of the fact that patients on these medications, it changes the kinds of uh, bacterial infections that they get and they're more likely to have um, particularly enterococcus infections. So when they come in for treatment of 
spontaneous bacterial paranoiasis, they get different antibiotics. Mm. So we have to cover them for enterococcus. So they get um, amoxicillin or ampicillin mm. when ordinarily we don't use that. We use oh, ceftriaxone. Okay. So you have to just be conscious of that. Mm. Patients who are on regular antibiotics may have different uh, pathogens mm. compared to the, the normal population. What's the benefit analysis there? I mean, if we're giving them one type of antibiotic to try and prevent these infections, but then when they do get the infections, they get you know resistant strains or different strains oh, of what, bacterial it, infections. It's not so much resistant strains. Mm. Um, the the risk of someone with decompensated cirrhosis getting bacterial peritonitis is is not insignificant. They are at risk of variceal bleeding. They're at risk of hepatorenal syndrome, which is frequently fatal. Um, and so we, we generally treat it if they've had it before. So it's always secondary prophylaxis. There is some evidence for primary prophylaxis for patients who, when you look at their acidic fluid, their protein level is very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're thought to be at risk of, of getting SBP in the first place. Um, uh, but there, there is good evidence for antibiotics. It's all about the antibiotics. That's my theme mm -hmm. for the day. No. Uh, <laughs> antibiotics is very important. So uh, we, if you've had... SBP before, you should be on prophylaxis unless there's some other contraindication to it, uh, definitely. Mm. Mm. Okay, are there any questions from our studio audience tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, that, let's, that was, I didn't understand that about long-term antibiotics in mm. cirrhosis mm. or severe mm. cirrhosis. I haven't had a patient on that um, regime, but that's just another role for the GP, you know, mm. explaining to them yet again, because that's long-term compliance, which could be an issue with a patient, and mm. it's the GP and the um, pharmacist's role to help support that, you know, mm. because they're going mm. to get... And um, so when the, the question is, how can the GP support patients? Chronic disease or people with long-term ongoing things, they often need things re-explained or they have other questions or they say the neighbour over the back fence said this and so why am I still on these antibiotics and, and mm. it's it's worth mm. and, and and the specialist will have that in the letter I'm sure so it's worth you know if you're seeing a patient you don't know them very well trawling through some of those old specialist letters just to mm. see the instructions will be there if it's something critical and important like that it will be there. And the other thing that's important as a GP registrar, if you find something like that and it's not highlighted as a warning in the chart, because that probably, you know, you're mm. wanting that patient mm. not to stop that antibiotic. Is mm. that what, yeah. Yes. That should, probably should be a warning. Mm. Long-term antibiotics. Mm -hmm. See gastroenterologist letter 2012 or whenever mm. it was. And it's, it's no... I would like that put on, mm. put on my patient, on the patient's file if the if it's not there as a warning. Because mm. if you come mm. in quickly to see that patient and you say, what on earth are you taking these things for? Mm. Um, mm. It would be foolish to stop them. And, you know, if that, and not just thinking about how to make it sure, sure that those mistakes don't happen, you know? Mm. So. It's not, I, I'd say it's not necessarily dangerous to, uh, to stop your antibiotics uh, suddenly. Um, the one that comes to mind is patients with varices who are on propranolol. Mm -hmm. If they're not compliant, they're almost better off not being on the propranolol because you're more worried about fluctuations in blood pressure. So mm -hmm. if okay. someone starts mm -hmm. and stops their propranolol, we're worried that they're at risk mm -hmm. of bleeding. So that's the one we're particularly worried about. But I can tell you my decompensated cirrhotic patients, if they, can t if they even know they're on antibiotics, that's an achievement. Because <laughs> <All right. laughs> they, they don't even know what dose of diuretics they're on. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm... There's always someone at home looking after medications and it's not them, I can tell you. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Any other comments, Fred? Is there anything you wanted yeah, to say I'm about pretty that? pretty happy at, for the case today. It is really mm. rare in a community pharmacy, so we don't have much to, a lot to deal with them. Um, but we do have a big client base for methadone and suboxone program who mm. have liver conditions. Mm. Uh, that is where pharmacists are encouraged to be involved um, as part of their plan and make sure that the compliance and um, point of care and refer back to the speci specialists and the doctors. Right. Yeah, we think that is really important as our role. Mm. Mm. Great. 
Yeah. Uh, just um, one final thought. If registrars have a, an interest in this sort of medicine, um, mm. in sort of hepatitis C treatment or something um, mm. along those lines, are there any courses or any um, resources that they should be aware of uh, for more education there? Mm. I, I think there was a course at some point a few years ago because mm. they were looking for more people and I think Brisbane ran a course but I haven't seen it advertised for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and now, if the requirement's going to reduce, you know, mm. yeah. I think they have a lot of uh, a lot of education set up for hepatitis nurses because most hospitals, large hospitals around Queensland, will have their hepatitis clinic and they have you know one or several nurses who manage these patients, and they're the ones that see have more patient contact with, than the specialists, mm. and so they. Uh, they run a lot of education sessions uh, around the place. And I think um, if you were interested in this area, though, it, because it's such an evolving area, it's one of the few areas of medicine that's really changed in the last five years, that um, you might want to mm. wait to see how things pan out with new treatments because uh, I think things are going to be a lot different. I think the burden on hepatitis clinics and on, hep on hepatitis nurses is going to reduce significantly. Uh, you know, it's going to be like giving patients blood pressure medication and then they come back after six weeks, uh, you know, uh, six months and it's all good, all done, cured. So mm. it's a completely different idea of, of treatment. Um, one thing I, I want, mm. wanted to say, though, um, this chap sounds like he was a compensated cirrhotic, but the mm. thing to be conscious of, occasionally patients with decompensated cirrhosis who, who are right on the edge between child's A and child's B cirrhosis do get treated. And... One of the uh, side effects of interferon treatment in those patients is that they become frankly decompensated. And so there have been a few patients in Toowoomba in the last six months who, who have done that, and they would present then with encephalopathy or variceal bleeding, but really critical uh, complications of their treatment, mm. and they have to be admitted to hospital. So it's important to be aware of that. Uh, if, the, if your interferon-treated patient's a little bit foggy in the head, are they... Is that normal for them mm -hmm. or are they actually now encephalopathic? Mm -hmm. Remember to look for the hepatic flap, which will detect grade 2 encephalopathy but not grade 1, which is, is subclinical often. Um, but these patients mm -hmm. need to be on lactulose, need to see their specialist, may need to stop treatment because once you decompensate, uh, that might be the end of the road. That's mm. where uh, hepatitis C treatment could lead to uh, a patient dying prematurely, uh, which we're very cautious mm. about. Because we're trying to treat patients who are not ready for liver transplant. We don't want to make the patient ready for a liver transplant. <laughs> That's not so good. Mm. Great. Just talking about courses, they, there, there is a methadone prescribing course once every year or two run out of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So if people are interested in the you know, treatment of for, um, drug narcotic use. drug use, etc. Yeah. Um, if uh, every now and then somebody, I, I think it's... Queensland Health or somebody runs a course every now and then. Great. Yeah. Just before we wrap up, I've had one que uh, question come through on the Twitter feed and it just um, harks back to these long-term antibiotics. How can the GP support patients in understanding the relevance of long-term antibiotics? What do you think, Lynn? Final thoughts? The relevance? Well, I tend to try to explain to patients their disease in, at whatever level they can understand it. Mm. And so um, I think it's understanding, mm. you know, to try mm. to explain immune deficiency and that liver failure means you're not making enough of the right proteins, you know, let, let, you know explain it to the patient. And that's... Mm. Um, and I guess that's my approach. If someone's not doing something, I try to explain it, that they get it, you know? Mm. I, th I guess that's and in the context of there's all these uh, campaigns like NPS about... Yeah, and um, NPS you know, you has been... Need a... yeah. well, well, I guess... And um, I don't think NPS are saying never have antibiotics. NPS mm -hmm. are coming out and saying, you know... You, the common cold doesn't it's need... It's a common yeah. cold, and mm. that's fair enough. And, and, I, and I think, you know, it is a lot different now than it was 20 years ago. More and more people are understanding. This is... I am going to get over this, aren't I, just without, without mm. antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I, so yes, to explaining that you, this has got nothing to do with the common cold, this is not mm -hmm. a virus, you are at risk of these severe infections called mm -hmm. bacterial infections and that's, so mm -hmm. whether it's, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so yeah, I'm just a great believer in trying to, and sometimes at the end of the day, I think I haven't even used any big long words all day because I'm trying to get my patients to understand at, you know, what their illness is about or, you know, something like that, you know, instead of use mm. the word hepatocellular <laughs> failure or da 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 that should be your liver cells are just got lots of fibrous knotting there and don't do their work, you know, or something like that. That's, you know, that, that's just my approach to it anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, being a good mm. communicator. It's, it's yeah. interesting though, because even the specialists sometimes don't know what the guidelines are. I know when I was working at the PA, we had a pamphlet for diet in liver cirrhosis. Mm. And it mentioned the, the Listeria diet, which mm -hmm. you would recommend for pregnant uh, patients is actually recommended for cirrhotic patients, presumably because if they get listeria, they get very sick. Um, and most of the specialists, specialists weren't aware of that. We weren't actually telling our patients to do that, but it was in the pamphlet that was being handed out. <laughs> so often we don't even know. And, and I know when we, were, when we were talking about the risk of enterococcus in patients on regular Bactrim, um, that's been in the therapeutic guidelines uh, for ooh, about four years that... Um, that wasn't even the practice in some of the hospitals because we mm. sometimes we we think we know so much that we don't even read the guidelines. Uh, but I can tell you the therapeutic guidelines are a very good resource. Yes, and I encourage uh, I you to, to use them, and and especially emergency departments because I I think they ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much uh, to the panel for their excellent discussion. But unfortunately, we are now out of time. Thank you to Nicole and Kent for their excellent case presentations and thank you to each of our specialist and expert panellists for their extremely valuable contribution to tonight's discussion. <laughs> I'd also like to finish with a special thanks to the support of the USQ Media Services. And that's it for another QRME Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. You can see our earlier presentations of the series on our YouTube channel. Uh, our next Grand Rounds will be held on Thursday, September the 10th, and it will be on the topic of geriatrics. We hope you will join us again then. Good night. <laughs>